everyone. I'm Golden Dawn Cancellaria Leslie McQuaid. Welcome back to Magic 101. Have a special guest today. I'm proud to have live with us Nineveh Shadrach, author of Magic That Works. Nineveh, are you there? Hello Leslie, thank you for having me. I'm honored by this invitation. Nineveh, you've established quite a reputation for yourself as the go-to guy on Ruhaniyat and Gen Magic. It's not me, it's the materials. People really love the system and love the results they're getting from it. We've heard similar stories from our own members. It's one of the reasons why we've invited you here today. I'm pretty new to your tradition myself, so I hope you'll bear with me. First, let me say time flies fast, and from what I understand, you've been doing this for nearly 20 years. It's worth it. When people look with respect at my readers and students due to their knowledge and spiritual experiences. Okay, let me first start by asking you, what exactly is Ruhaniyat? I'm not familiar with the term. Ruhaniyat stems from the Arabic word for spirit, ruh, which is identical to the Hebrew word ruach. Ruhaniyat covers a variety of esoteric and occult disciplines. Its purpose is the empowerment of one's spirit. Would it be classified more as mysticism or as magic? Ruhaniyat takes a wholesome approach to one's spiritual development. It combines a variety of disciplines together and, of course, mystical techniques. However, it's not a passive approach. I know lots of our viewers are interested in Jinn magic, and I'm sure we're all curious. Does the practice of Ruhaniyat directly tie in with the practice of Jinn magic? Directly, nothing. Indirectly, making contact with the jinn was a point of focus for a number of Rohaniyat practitioners. Ah, okay. You know, I know lots of people who are attracted to jinn magic, but there's also those who are scared of it. When people think of jinn magic, what they're really thinking of is a spell that gets a jinn to appear, to make their wishes come true, especially in areas of love and money. It's true that jinn magic can help us build a gap between our reality and theirs. However, I feel that what we should do once this connection is built should be guided by something greater than immediate mundane needs or desires. Are you saying that you've never called a jinn to help out in a love or a money spell? Maybe once or twice in my early teens when I was still wet behind the ears. But no, generally, I don't call on the jinn for that purpose. I actually don't call on the jinn very much. Oh, wow. I find this amazing considering all of your stories with the jinn. How did that ever happen then? I said I don't call on the jinn very much. I didn't say I don't have contact with them. Why would the jinn reach out to you, Nineveh? The jinn are independent beings. If they are interested in you, then they'll pop in often into your life. They can also teach whomever they want to teach. Evocation isn't always necessary. I'm sure that'll get lots of head shaking. Do you have an example of a jinn showing up to you without you doing any sort of ritual magic practice to call it forth? One night, I was silently reading a conjuration to the King Badur. I had gotten a really good vibe of this king and I wanted to meet him, or at least one of his servitors. I set my mind to do an evocation six months down the road. 
It was past midnight, which is pretty much Jin activity time. In other traditions, midnight is known as the witching hour. It's said that the spirits or fairies would come out during that time. What a coincidence, right? Yeah, I call it Jin hour. Francis, with whom I was sharing an apartment, pops in and tells me that we've got a visitor in the bedroom. I went in and I saw her very large hanging planter spinning really fast. This was a pretty large pot. It would be hard for me to make it spin that fast. The windows were closed and there was zero air draft. I could feel the presence of a gin and I could see a silhouette of his translucent body. I said, if indeed a gin is there, then spin this planter counterclockwise. Instantly, the fast spinning planter came to a complete halt and started spinning the other way. That's a pretty solid example right there. I don't think I've heard very many stories like this in the magical community. Why do you think the djinn just showed up like that? I think the djinn were watching me and due to their telepathic nature knew of my intentions and decided to skip the wait time and evocation process. King Badur sent a viceroy immediately to my room to see what I wanted. Oh, my. Well, what do you think made you so special? You're asking the wrong question. The important point here is that the jinn were watching me. We don't know how many more of us they're watching. According to jinn lore, we each have a karin or a familiar from the jinn. The karin watches and influences its human target. This is all done invisibly. They could do a more direct display for everyone, but they don't. It's as if they don't want people to have proof that they're there. Yes. This is part of the reason that many people struggle to get tangible results from their evocations. Do you think the ancient magicians knew that the jinn would resist? Of course. That's why the grimoires are full of threats and admonitions to the spirits to obey or else be hurt or destroyed. Can I argue a counterpoint here? I do hear of people who use methods like Goetia and get results. Mm-hmm. But go and read the forums and comments or even the more recent books on the subject. People are excited when they see funky smoke, candle flames dancing, or just feel strange energy around them. I'd call that physical results, wouldn't you? If people were getting consistent physical results, just like the ancient grimoires, then the ongoing debate on whether these beings are objectively real or not would have been settled. Okay, okay, you're right. You know, people do spend many hours and so much money painstakingly ma making old magical circles, carving wooden knives, implements, all of this based on these grimoires. As they say, magicians love their toys, right? I prefer to have dinner with my beautiful wife and watch the sunset by the lake. I am betting lots of people share this sentiment. Okay, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that people are doing this because they have no choice? They believe that by accurately replicating the instructions in older grimoires, it will improve their odds at physical manifestations. Since we have you here, why don't you share with us some tips on how to improve these odds? Okay, I'll give you three. One, turn off the electricity in your house. Two, don't eat meat and don't have meat in your house before and during the workings. Three, burn dried cilantro often. You do know that this will sound a little weird to us Westerners. Maybe, but the key thing is whether or not it works. And it works, which is what we're looking for. Results. I'll give it a try. I hope you don't mind, but I have a personal question. How did you start? What got you interested in jinn magic in the first place? Jinn are pretty much a central part of Islamic belief. You've got a whole surah in the Qur'an dedicated to the jinn. Ah, it was your religious upbringing then. 
Actually, in my teens, I was more interested in things like building my own telescope, programming my own game on Apple IIc, and being an all-around nerd. So what happened? During high school, people started coming up to me and asking me all kinds of questions related to magic and the djinn. When I asked them why they were doing this, they said the djinn told us about you and said you have the answers, which at the time I didn't. Oh my God, that's incredible. How did you feel about that? It scared the hell out of me. I was living in a country that cut off the head of anybody associated with magic or the jinn. You were living in Saudi Arabia, right? Yeah, my family was working there. What did you do? I had no one to tell me that once you walked through that door, there was no turning back. I didn't walk. I leaped through the door, and I'm still falling. Don't be offended, but I've got the Golden Dawn. Why should I study your tradition? I believe that people can use this system to break through the barriers which keep them from experiencing the divine connection. I want you and everyone else to have the keys to your own awakening and enlightenment. I'd love to see authentic magic flourish in our world. Hey, you know, it's not lost. There's thousands of books, online forums, our order, videos, blogs. True, but people, even many magicians, have become skeptical of magic as something fantastic or amazing. Many have even begun to argue against the spiritual dimensions. Well, that's because we're tired of religion. Plus, magic is not mysticism. Our culture is built on science, so it's natural for us to be skeptical and even encouraged. It isn't about labels. It's about our true nature the true nature of the universe, and our place within the schema. By giving up the magical side of magic and accepting only the psychological dimension, we're leaving on the table the key to our own ascension and enlightenment. You think we in the community have been going about it all wrong? Give me an example. Sure, I'd love to, but it's not about being right or wrong. It's about things getting stagnant. We need to ask new questions to push the dimensions and limits of our craft. For example, when was the last time someone asked, how do we pull on the energy of this or that star? We're still working the energy of our planet's moon. But in my book on Zadkiel, I explored the magic of the various moons of Jupiter. We should also be asking questions like this. Can we use magic to explore the past or know more about the future? Can we use magic to master teleportation as mode of travel to help ease the pollution in our environment? Teleportation, really? To ease pollution in the environment? Why? Ancient books and magic have mentioned it. I thought teleportation was only scientifically possible at the atomic level right now. Having witnessed it as many times as I have, I gotta say, science needs to go back to the drawing board on that one. Well, what does this have to do with the jinn? The jinn have already mastered the art of teleportation. It was they who manifested this power to us many times. Jinn are way more advanced in the arena of magic. I take it further and say, that most of the ancient magic books that we have are the result of jinn-aided transmission. I probably should have asked this before, but who are the jinn and what does that word even mean? The word jinn means hidden or concealed, and that's exactly what they are. They are a semi-physical ancient race that cohabits this planet with us. They can touch us and affect our physical world, but yet we cannot see them. Well, of course not. They're spirits, aren't they? Spirits in the sense of having a spirit, yes. Spirits in the sense of being non-physical, 
spiritual energy that can't interact with the physical world? No, they're not ghosts. Okay, I guess not, since they moved that planter. What else have you seen them do? I've seen them move heavy objects. I've seen them set things on fire and then watch the fire disappear and leave no smoke or burning trace. I've seen them raise the temperature of an airplane to the point that the captain had to say something and then just as quickly return the temperature to normal. I've seen them manifest blinding light with no physical source. I've seen them do all kinds of things that shouldn't be possible in a world governed by the laws of modern secular materialism. You're either going to make lots of magicians jealous, or they'll rush to read all your books, or they'll just decide you're making it up. However, I've talked to people who either verified your stories or had similar experiences working your materials. I know it's hard for our Western mind to accept, but I have to say, I can't wait to find out for myself. Okay, I know what all this means to me personally, but what does it mean to you, Nineveh? It means that as much as science has given us useful tools and technology, our own model of the universe needs to have its limitations removed. It also means that magicians have the opportunity to be at the frontier of exploring these limits because scientists at the moment aren't even considering the possibility. I'm not sure we're ready. We have to be. We have to put aside the politics and squabbling. And we have to move beyond the prove it to me phase and start really asking, where's the bottom of this well? What is there to prove? Most magicians believe. Do they? I can't count how many times folks have said to me, I'll pay you this or that much to prove to me spirits are real. And those were people who were supposed to be highly ranked in the Golden Dawn. It's like a deja vu of Randy's challenge. What's wrong with people wanting to have proof? Nothing. But it's elementary. It's the kind of questions people ask when they're still not sure this stuff is real. This is why I worry that lots of magicians today are stagnant in the prove it to me phase. We need to start asking ourselves how far we can make magic happen in the physical world. And if we can't or don't know how, then we need to ask, what are we missing? Magic as a path of power. I think you'll get lots of people to sign up for that. We should push the limits of magical knowledge. The power in of itself isn't relevant. What's relevant is how any of the promises of magic can make our world a better, safer, healthier, and more balanced place for us to live. We can't do that if we don't really believe in magic beyond the most superficial serendipity or psychological model. Let's change track for a second. I have to ask. You put a lot of heavy and interesting information in your books and reports. Do you really benefit and practice at all? Whenever I write a book or a report, I ask myself a set of questions. Will this help me? Will this help my children? Will this help my magical friends and their children? Will this information make the magical currents stronger in this world? Unless I get yes to all of those questions, I don't put this material out there. I really, really want everyone, from a total beginner to the most advanced, to have magic at their disposal that shakes the core of their reality and pushes the boundaries of their consciousness. In your opinion, is Jinn magic the most powerful system of magic known to us today? There's no doubt that Jinn are very magical creatures, and any magical system that involves them is exceptionally powerful. The only other system I know of that tops it involves star magic, 
but it's also the least explored, least known, and least practiced system. You're a prolific writer, and while your materials are not very expensive, it will cost a bit for me to get them all. I think lots of people who are new to this might feel the same way. Would you consider offering a discount to people that are listening who are totally new to Gen Magic? Let me get back to you. I'm sure you will. Well, thank you, Nineveh, for joining us. Hope to have you on again soon. You're welcome, and thank you again for this invitation. Now, following our interview, I press Nineveh on how you can get started with Gen Magic. Would you like to see just how quickly and easily your life can be transformed through magic? Getting started with Gin Magic can be simple when you know what steps to take. That's why, following our interview, I pressed Nineveh Shadrach to prepare a special free report just for you. It's called Summon Gin Like a Master, Five Steps to Your First Successful Gin Evocation for Power, Love, Money, and Health. And it walks you through five basic steps to begin working with Jen that will help you manifest things like more money, a better love life, better health, and more. It's laid out in simple step-by-step -step detail so you can put it to use and get results. It's the fastest, easiest, most effective way to put Jen magic to work in your life starting today. To claim your free copy, go to ginpower.com right now. Or just click the link below. Thanks for watching. Until next time, I'm Golden Dawn Cancellaria Leslie McQuaid, and this is Magic 101.